My name is Lindy Cameron, and I'm the CEO of the National Cyber Security Centre here in the UK. And I'm absolutely delighted that uh, that uh, down the line from New Zealand, we have uh, Herman Hauser with us today, uh, one of the uh, the leading lights of the UK's tech investing scene, but also a serial entrepreneur and innovator, and uh, responsible for for some of the names we all remember: uh, Acorn, Arm, uh, a key figure in Olivetti, um, and Niamades Capital. So, Herman, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. And we're here today uh, um, to, to have a conversation which will form part of our uh, of our day two of Cyber UK, the UK's leading cybersecurity conference. Um, but really what I wanted to do was to talk to you a bit about your experience of helping to try and drive innovation. And in particular, from our perspective, innovation in, in technology and in cyber secure technology. Um, here in the UK. So I wondered if perhaps you could reflect for me on some of the highlights when you, as you look back on the on the, the amazing things you've done in your career, what are the particular highlights that you could pull out? Well, things have developed uh, enormously over the last uh, 30 years now that I've been doing this uh, from, from the early days, especially in the Cambridge area, uh, where okay. it was uh, still very difficult to finance uh, deep technology uh, companies. Um, and um, of course, early on, I specialized on chip companies uh, like the, the ARM and the CSR, which is a Bluetooth company, uh, and later on also in, in life sciences. So uh, the, uh, the whole ecosystem has matured, uh, matured enormously. There's a lot more venture capital. When I first started my first company <laughs> called Acorn Computers, I had to go to the bank to, to get an overdraft. That was the way we financed the company. There was no venture capital. Now there's a lot more venture capital available and knowledgeable venture capital in deep technology, which is really what you need for uh, uh, for cybersecurity. Fantastic. So, so you described the way that you started that first company in Cambridge. How important do you think that ecosystem of of academic interface with uh, with engineering expertise and with 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 the business sector it was then, and how much has it changed now? Oh, well, it is crucial. It's absolutely crucial if you look at all the nations in the world that uh, uh, that that do have uh, a working um, uh, innovation system it <laughs> all is based on the interaction between universities uh, the government uh, and the uh, finance community it's a, it, it's it's a team sport i always say that <laughs> uh, you know deep technology startups are a team sport you've got to have all these players uh, work together and cybersecurity is is becoming much a much more important part of the whole uh, ecosystem. Uh, needs especially close uh, collaboration between government, finance, and the uh, tech community. So, what were the other challenges that you faced in some of those uh, those key moments you, you you faced in your career? Well, to start off with, probably the the, the single most important uh, hurdle to overcome was a cultural one. Uh, when I first started doing this uh, at Cambridge University, um, Cambridge professors <laughs> told me, what, what do you mean we, we, we want to do a, a spin out? Who, who do you think I am to dirty my pure academic hands doing this deal with Mammon? <laughs> this, is a, this is not what I do. This is, a, you know, I'm a, I'm a good guy. I don't, <laughs> I don't get involved in, in commerce or any of the dirty things that people do with uh, with my research. So, and this has changed, fortunately, 180 degrees. People are very are comfortable and very keen to now help uh, translate uh, uh, these these breakthroughs that we see at our universities into successful companies <clears throat> that contribute to the to the tax revenue, which actually fund the university research in the first place. Absolutely. I mean, it seems extraordinary to, to look back now and imagine the, the difference uh, there. I mean, how replicable do you think, do you think that, that is? I mean, people think of, of Cambridge as somewhere that is really quite special in the way it's done that. But how much of that model do you think can be replicated elsewhere? Well, it has been re re replicated uh, across Europe. Uh, I'm delighted to say that uh, the UK is still in the lead. Uh, we have uh, you know, four of the, of the top 10 uh, universities in the world with uh, um, uh, Cambridge, Oxford, uh, University College London, and Imperial. So we've got a, an excellent uh, sort of engine uh, of, of 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 clever research that uh, uh, can then be be spun out and um, 
create these uh, these deep technology companies. Uh, Britain has the largest uh, venture capital community in Europe, although you know Europe is is catching up. Uh, I always feel that if Silicon Valley is here and uh, the UK is here and, Aus and uh, Europe is here and, and Austria is right down there, always the last one. And what, have the, what, what do you think the challenges have been? So what has stopped it going? You know, what, have, what has stopped other places replicating that? Well, one, one problem is this cultural problem that people, <laughs> the first thing that, that needs to happen is that people feel comfortable with uh, uh, science translation or contribute to it. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> you have to have the lawyers, the accountants, the people who understand uh, supporting companies that uh, don't have any revenue, uh, that are loss making. Uh, you know, people have got to be comfortable with that, uh, at which they weren't when we started Acorn Computers. I had all these people coming coming in helping us with the, with the finance. <laughs> uh, we, we all put them in a room with the books and they, they, they came out ash faced and said, you're over trading as badly as we've never seen anybody over trade in Europe. Oh, we said, yes, <laughs> this, is, this is exactly what the last guy said <laughs> and continued. Uh, and uh, you know, we, at that time we were the fastest growing company ever in Britain going from zero to 100 million in five years. So, you know, people just hadn't seen this before. I was really struck reading about some of the things you did in those early days about how much you broke ground in the, in the way that you changed the expectations of the academic community, but also the way you changed expectations of what startups looked like. It must have been quite a challenge to be a, you know, that, the leader in that field, to, to really innovate, um, to have to, to find the pathways that nobody had found before. What are the particular moments you can tell us about that, uh, where, where you had to do that? Yes, we were, we were the pioneers with lots of arrows in our backs as well. So we, we had to learn uh, on the job, so to speak. Uh, you know, the way we, we financed um, Acorn Computers, my first company, was uh, absolutely uh, unique. And uh, unfortunately, we could uh, never repeat this again because it's still the only company that I know of in the world uh, that had a capital gain of a millionfold. So every Every pound we put in was worth a million pounds when we went in public because uh, Chris and I, who founded Acorn Computers, didn't have any money. So the, the, the total amount of money that we put into Acorn Computers was 200 pounds. But looking forward to the future then, basically, um, how, is it that, that, how, how do you see the future? So, so if you were starting up as an entrepreneur today in technology, where would you be looking for the opportunities and what would you see as the challenges? Well, uh, this is actually the best time to, to start a company. Uh, if you look at the history of uh, deep technology, it's normally during, a, well, we're not quite in a recession yet, but during a downturn, uh, you have access to good talent because some of the large companies are shedding uh, good people. Uh, the venture capital community normally takes a much longer term view. So uh, the venture money hasn't gone away. The venture, venture money is there. To, to fund these companies. The ecosystems in, in a number of uh, uh, British uh, ecosystems exist in Cambridge and Oxford and in London and in Edinburgh. So there's, it's not just uh, uh, one or two in Bristol. Well, there are quite a few now. So, um, so things are, are rather easier now than they were when I started. Fantastic. And how do you see the changes in the next decade? Well, uh, innovative companies, and in particular, deep technology companies, both on the ICT side and on the life science side, is really where the growth in the economy is going to come from. Uh, we're not going to get it by uh, producing Nike shoes or uh, you know any of the uh, traditional sectors. It has to come from uh, innovative breakthroughs that come out of universities or uh, big research labs. And uh, the ecosystems that now exist are, are, the, are the basis that allow you to build these companies and build them now much faster than ever before. I mean, we've just had the most spectacular example with uh, chat GDP, which went from zero to, I think, five million users in a week or two, <laughs> or five days, I think, was the, uh, zero to a, a million users. So Instagram, I think, was the previous record holder. And the normal, so there are these graphs that, that show how long it takes uh, to get a million users, and it used to be years, of course. And, uh, you know, last year with ChatGPT, it was five days. 
I know it's extraordinary, and I think the you know, the way that it's changed uh, the public's perception of technology. I mean, clearly, lots of people who worked in this I feel understood the potential. But I think you know the conversation we're now having about large language models and the potential there, but also the understanding of how that will affect people's lives and businesses. I think has it's been a really a really seminal moment, uh, as well as uh, people are uh, uh, thinking about how they can use it for risk as well as opportunity. It will be it will be a game changer, and I'm just writing a book on uh, technology sovereignty where I go into a bit more detail on four technologies that I believe will change our lives in the next five to 10 years, not sort of 10 to 30 years. And these are, of course, AI and machine learning now with chat GDP being in the headlines all the time. Um, a synthetic biology, uh, which actually long-term, I think is probably the most important one because it concerns our, our health. Um, blockchain and smart contracts, which uh, is still highly underestimated, and and because of the uh, because of the problems with um, uh, with Bitcoin and uh, you know all these block the, the these uh, stable coins etc. got a bad name. Although the underlying technology, especially say for central bank digital currencies. Uh, can be revolutionary and really takes a lot of friction out of the university and, and uh, out of the economy. And people haven't really understood that the blockchain has, has a much wider uh, application field than uh, just these uh, uh, these coins. And last but not least, where I spend a lot of my time at the moment, quantum computing. Uh, and it's it's mm -hmm. it's a great delight for me who uh, you know contributed a little bit to the growth of the classical computer sector to see a completely new and completely different uh, way of doing computing. And as a physicist, of course, uh, quantum computing is particularly exciting. So competition is clearly vital, but I mean, we've seen failures where the market has not produced the kind of competition. We, we, we saw this particularly in the telecom supply chain, for example, I think with the dependence on a small number of companies, and in particular in the low cost end of the market, um, you know, a real lack of choice. So, so how is it that we can um, try and incentivize uh, for us, of course, in particular, not only a, a real choice, but also a, a, a choice that is a secure choice. Well, that's the <laughs> one of the jobs of government uh, that uh, governments do have to uh, enforce uh, uh, monopoly uh, provisions to prevent companies from, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> achieving a um, uh, Findel Hirschfeld index, uh, which is the index that uh, economists use to, to tell you how a competitive particular sector is. And the government, uh, you know, just needs to step in when companies have, um, you know, a ridiculous market share and, and are abusing uh, that market share to have monopoly pricing, keeping uh, new competitors out. And when it comes to security, um, you know, governments have to ensure that we've got access to all the machinery, all the instrumentation, all the computers, all the technology uh, that uh, allows a country to uh, ensure the security of government, but also of the economy. We can modify some of the the options and choices people have. Things like two factor authentication that that just make it make it make it harder. But surely we ought to have been able to reduce the attack surface uh, more effectively over time. To, to lower the vulnerability of the technology itself. And, and that's clearly not something that the market is demanding. And part of that, I suppose, is because you know, people don't want to invest in understanding the technology they're buying. They simply want to know how it functions and what it will do for them. But surely there must be a debate a debate in the technology ecosystem about, about how to try and create incentives to do that better. Uh, yes, there is. And, and things are getting better. The, the attack surfaces are being reduced. A uh, two-factor two uh, authentication is being uh, introduced by, you know, if you want to uh, log into Chrome now, it's a two-factor uh, authentication, same with Apple and, uh, and the other uh, big companies. So this, this does make it uh, harder and is a, a fantastic step in the right direction. Um, uh, but it's an ongoing war uh, between, you know, improving the cybersecurity uh, that is built in and uh, the, the cleverer and cleverer attacks that uh, people um, dream up to uh, circumvent. So, so where are you on the sort of balance of effort between uh, government, business, academia, sort of where does the responsibility most lie to try and change those incentives? 
uh, like with uh, the innovation e ecosystem, this is a team sport. Uh, you know, we, we need government to do uh, their bit, both on the awareness side, on the, leg on the uh, legislation side, uh, the uh, financial community to invest in uh, cybersecurity uh, startups, because there are lots of um, uh, clever new ways of doing that, uh, being aware that uh, quantum computers are a big game changer, a very fundamental game changer of uh, uh, attacking the, the most widely used encryption standard that we have in the world with the RSA 2048 standard, um, but we all need to work together on it. And it's going, it's, going to bring, uh, it's going to stay with us forever. So this is an ongoing effort uh, that everybody has to produce. There is no silver bullet. Uh, you know, it's not something that we can uh, flick a switch one day and say we've sold. No, and, and, and so what would you say, looking at the UK today, what are the real strengths of that UK ecosystem? Well, we, starting off with GCHQ, uh, we actually have, uh, and, uh, you know, the tradition of uh, Alan Turing, who was a fellow of my co King, uh, college, King's College uh, in Cambridge. There's a lot of tradition and, and, and fantastic work that has been done uh, in the past in cybersecurity. To, uh, so Britain is actually uh, acknowledged as a... Um, a country uh, that has uh, excellent cybersecurity expertise, as it happens, uh, we're also one of the leading uh, countries when it comes to really exciting uh, startups in, in quantum computing. Uh, although the, the one that uh, managed to raise most of the money, which is SciQuantum, which is a spin out from Bristol University, had to go to Silicon Valley to be uh, funded, so it's now an American company. but. Uh, uh, I read just uh, last week that, uh, that there is now a British collaboration uh, that Sai Quantum has, has started as well with government help and some some government uh, mm -hmm. money. So, so we're not doing badly, but uh, we have got to do a lot more. So what more can we do? What would you like to see the UK doing to, to make it an even more attractive place to, to, to create in that investment? Well, one of the... <clears throat> Uh, a key thing is government, I think, needs to do a lot more is uh, creating this awareness uh, that this is a much bigger problem uh, than uh, that than people uh, think. So uh, an awareness program and, uh, you know, just very simple uh, guidelines on where to find, uh, you know, training, where to find uh, the sort of simple things that you can do, like passwords and watching out for scams and, uh, and, and things like that. And then uh, <clears throat> making sure that there is a, um, uh, 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 that there, there are, uh, it's a framework uh, that allows cybersecurity companies to flourish in the UK, both legal uh, in terms of, you know, having sandboxes where these companies can try things out uh, safely and uh, access to um, uh, to government uh, people to get guidance of what what government really needs and uh, you know i'm delighted that with ensif the government has created a, a fund uh, that is willing to co-invest with the uh, with the uh, market uh, vcs in these cybersecurity companies so how do we change the incentives to make that happen well Money makes the world go around. So, <laughs> uh, it, you know, you can't do it without money. So uh, you need financial incentives. Uh, we have the NCIF fund, which is, I think, a fantastic first step. Uh, but we need a lot more uh, money, both from government and from the venture community to fund these, uh, these new security uh, companies that are trying to uh, uh, Cover the holes that exist in in all the layers of the uh, of the computing uh, hierarchy and make them more secure. So, Herman, what happens if we do nothing? Well, <laughs> bad things happen because uh, <clears throat> a lot of our world uh, is becoming more autonomous. Uh, have uh, autonomous cars. Uh, we have lots of robots. Uh, uh, you know, I, I've just uh, bought a, rob a robot for my for cleaning my my house here <laughs> in um, in New Zealand, and I discovered 
uh, that I can over Wi-Fi, uh, I can see what the robot is doing because it's got a camera. So, you know, this robot shows me where it's going and where it's cleaning, etc. And this is all going over Wi-Fi. So if somebody hacks my Wi-Fi, they can, they can, and, and they hack into my robot, uh, they have a, a machine uh, that can find out the insides of my house and whether anybody is here and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, but this is just one, it's just a consumer product, right? This is not a high security, this is not even uh, an autonomous car which can kill people if, um, if it gets hacked. And uh, so there are lots of different layers of security, starting with the microprocessor. And that's one of the reasons why ARM has introduced the trust zone, I think now 20 years ago. And, and there are more, uh, more and more deeply uh, embedded uh, security systems, starting with the chip design uh, that makes it uh, harder, if not impossible, uh, to hack um, uh, systems, uh, even you know, little systems like um, uh, robots that clean your house. And so it starts with the chip level. Then uh, I was delighted to find out recently, we now have a, um, uh, a microkernel, which is the sort of small operating system uh, that has been proved correct. Uh, one of the big problems in, uh, in software is that when people write software, uh, they don't actually normally uh, do a mathematical proof that what they wrote actually is going to do what they intended to do. And proving uh, that what you have written is actually what you intended, to, uh, has the consequences that you originally intended is, is an extremely difficult problem. That's you know, called proving, it's proof theory, it's proving, uh, proving things to be correct. So there's a lot of effort going into that. We're making great progress, but you know, very there is no 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 operating system that is proved correct except for the SEL4 uh, microkernel, which is widely used. So this is these are things all the way up the stack from the software over the operating system through the applications, uh, and we've got to have efforts at all layers. So how do we try and build resilience into that future? By supporting the uh, uh, research and then the, the spin-out companies uh, with the expertise that allow us to uh, come up with solutions for uh, each of the layers of the stack. And by uh, divide and conquer. So uh, one of the uh, things that is so dangerous, of course, uh, with these attacks is if they get into the, uh, a central system, a lot of our systems are very centralized. Uh, once you get into the center, you've got control of everything. So one of the exciting developments in, in security are these microkernels and, and, and the, the return of the capability machine. Uh, you know, Cambridge, of course, uh, invented the, the capability machines and uh, there are lots of stories in Cambridge, uh, uh, lots of uh, you know, exciting stories about the capability machine, which uh, everybody thought was a brilliant idea and why it didn't work. <laughs> But there is a, a, a resurgence of that basic idea of having capabilities where you divide things up into areas that, that are self-contained and cannot be, uh, cannot be cracked. So that's um, uh, an interesting development that I'm engaged in at the moment. Great. Amon Hauser, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.